The explanation we have given is oversimplified. It is based on the forward radiation of a single layer. Actually, each dipole layer also radiates backwards. The backscattered dipole waves from interior layers such as this one are scattered forward again, and so on. An exact theory must take such multiple scattering into account. It turns out, however, that our simplified explanation reaches the same qualitative conclusions as does the exact theory. To summarize, we've been treating the incident light as an electromagnetic wave. Its effect on the molecules of the optically transmitting materials is to convert them into oscillating dipoles. Since these materials are non-conductors, the oscillating electric charges in their molecules will remain bound to each other. When you stretch the bound charged particles away from their equilibrium positions, they will experience a restoring force pulling them back together toward equilibrium. Let us make another bold assumption, namely, that the restoring force is linear, which means it is proportional to the amount of displacement, as, for example, in a mass connected to a spring. This system can oscillate on its own with a natural frequency. It is weakly damped, mostly by the wheel bearing. Similarly, the oscillating dipoles experience damping. But here, a good part of the energy they lose will go off as radiation. An eccentric linkage creates an oscillating force. It drives the outer end of the coil spring. The other end is attached to the wheel's axle. Keep your eye on the two pointers. One is attached to the driving bar and the other to the wheel. They allow us to compare the response of the wheel to the driving force. The frequency is small and lies far below the natural frequency of this oscillator. Notice that the wheel follows at the same frequency. And if it weren't for static friction temporarily freezing the bearings of the wheel at the amplitude position, the wheel would follow the driver exactly in phase as well. Similarly, our molecular oscillating dipoles will follow exactly in phase if they are driven by incident light whose frequency lies sufficiently below their natural frequency. Static friction does not occur inside individual molecules. George is raising the driver frequency toward the natural frequency but it is still below it. The wheel again follows at this new and larger frequency. Two things have changed. The amplitude has grown, and the wheel lags behind the phase of the driver. It can't keep up. This phase lag increases as the driver approaches the natural frequency. The driver frequency is now set to the natural frequency. The response amplitude grows quite large. We call this condition resonance. Notice that the oscillator is at its extreme, its amplitude position, just starting back, at the same time that the driver passes zero. The oscillator lags the driving force by one quarter oscillation. At resonance, the phase lag is 90 degrees, and the amplitude has maximum value. The phase lag continues to increase as the driving frequency is raised beyond resonance. It reaches 180 degrees as a limiting value. Notice that the oscillator's amplitude is down again, and that it lags the driver by half an oscillation. For example, the driver is at extreme right, when the wheel is at extreme left, the phase lag is 180 degrees. Keep in mind these properties of harmonic oscillators regarding amplitude response and phase lag. They apply to the electric dipole oscillators 
driven by an electromagnetic wave. Of course, the dipole's resonant frequency is much higher than for our mechanical analog. It might lie anywhere in the electromagnetic spectrum. As a matter of fact, there may be many different resonances for any one material. We return to the molecular layer driven by an incident light wave. Remember that we chose the dipole response to be in phase with the oscillations of the incident field. We now understand the significance of this choice. The dipole oscillators have their own resonant frequency, but the frequency of the incident light is far below this resonance. Even so, the layer delays the resultant signal, as I explained earlier because the radiation from the various dipoles of the layer has to cover large distances to reach a forward point, such as P. At frequencies below the dipole's resonance, the phase velocity of light in the material is smaller than C. Consider the oscillating electric field in a wave arriving at P. This vector can be defined as the projection of a uniformly rotating vector a fixed length, called a phasor. It goes around once for each full oscillation of the field vector. Its length equals the field's amplitude. To make our construction simpler, we fade out the oscillating field vector. We just agree that the projection of this phasor upon a vertical line through the dot is the electric field arriving at P. Let's suppose that this phasor corresponds to the incident field, which has gotten through the molecular layer. Now, in addition, the dipoles in the layer radiate forward. And, as we told you earlier, the composite wave from all the dipoles in the layer lags behind the incident wave by exactly 90 degrees. The superposition of the two waves is the projection on the red vertical line of the rotating resultant. Notice that the resultant lags behind the incident wave. Now that we know that these phasors are supposed to be rotating vectors, we can stop them and let this arrow remind us. So here we have our schematic representation of conditions at a point, P, beyond the dipole layer. The 90 degree phase delay in the radiation from the dipole layer causes the resultant signal to have this phase lag relative to the incident radiation reaching the point. Let me again remind you that this condition occurs when the dipoles in the layer respond in phase to the incident wave as it passes over the layer. This happens when the frequency of the incident radiation lies sufficiently far below the dipole's resonance. Next, let us figure out what should happen if we raise this frequency toward resonance? By our mechanical analogy, we know that as we do this, the dipole response becomes stronger and its phase begins to lag. At resonance, the lag reaches 90 degrees and the response amplitude is at maximum. So, the dipole radiation from the layer toward forward points such as P will acquire additional phase delay and the phasor representing it will point downward in this picture. At resonance, it will point vertically down. Let's look at this again. As resonance is approached, the amplitude of the dipole wave grows toward a maximum. We shall repeat this motion a third time, and as you look at it, concentrate on the resultant. The phase lag of the resultant signal first increases, reaches a maximum, and then decreases. At resonance, the resultant is in phase with the incident component. At the same time, the resultant becomes shorter and shorter. 